Welcome to Conversations with Karalia, where we take a nuanced deep dive into all things related to spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. My name is Karalia, and I'm your host for this journey. I invite you to relax back, open up, and get curious. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share the love. Alrighty, folks, get ready for this conversation with Karalia. Next up on the show is Melissa Billington. Melissa Billington was born in the USA. She was introduced to yoga at the tender age of seven. And I met her in Wellington in 2008. So we have been friends now for 15 years. Uh, Melissa was running the Power Center, P-O-W-A, at the time, which was um, a yoga studio that hosted a bunch of other things as well. She is an incredible woman. She's actually a godmother to my son. And when I moved back to Wellington, when um, I had my son as a single parent, she was one of the few people that kind of got how challenging it is to be the single parent of a toddler. And she would make a point of reaching out and saying, hey, can I take Sam and hang out with him? So she's a special woman, is Melissa. Um, She has been saying water prayers for a number of years now. She fucker puffers to, of all people, Pocahontas um, and actually did a one woman stage show called Pocahontas which I'm pretty sure is still available on YouTube uh, I got to go see it in person and it was an extraordinary exploration of the colonization of the stories of invaded peoples you could say uh, so I know that Melissa and I are going to have a wealth of things to talk about um, I would just say, as always, do stay to the end. Uh, Melissa has been studying stand-up comedy for the past few years. She's also an actor. She's um, That's another one of her strings to her bow. And I think she might share some performance with us at the end of the conversation. So make sure you stick around for that. All righty, let's see what Melissa has to say. Melissa, welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> where in the world are you i have had trouble keeping up in the last couple of years and yeah. <laughs> what are you getting up to at the moment right yeah well i've been having trouble keeping up with myself actually i'm still uh six months behind in posting on on instagram of where i've been so everybody's like wait did you move again because <laughs> i'm trying to catch up with myself before my birthday um i am currently in brisbane mm-hmm. Queensland, eastern australia and uh, I have been on quite a walkabout for a number of years. Mm. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you track back, when do you <laughs> think that did that walkabout actually start? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, well, uh, right. When I, when I started my blog, Earthwide Tribe, and started uh, my Instagram, um, mm. which was 2014, Mm-hmm. And so that was when I handed over the yoga studio in Wellington and um, I had just premiered Pocahontas, shape-shifting history into her story. And that very much was like a, a birth. It was a cathartic, um, shamanistic piece uh, mm. that was mixing indigenous storytelling that's rooted in um, collective uh origin stories and uh song and dance and ceremony with Mm. that sort of fourth wall western type of theater um and then i was able to head across and wanted to see my grandfather uh before Mm. he passed on at 101 so i was able to get back to the u.s which i hadn't been able to do when i had the studio just mm-hmm. holding down the commercial lease in Wellington was taxing. And, yeah. Um, How long did you have that lease for in Wellington? Five years. Five years. Okay, cool. Yeah. So 
I'm really curious about Pocahontas. Like that, I mean, I was there. I got to go and see it in person, which was amazing. And you, I mean, right from the get go, it's obvious that this was not your ordinary one woman stage show. Like if I remember correctly, we started outside and we got called into the mm. space. And then mm. when we were in there, we were set up completely different. From what I recall, we were down both sides and you were in the middle and you were using the whole space. Yeah. Um, what inspired you to write and then perform that particular stage show? Uh, well, this ancestry, Baka Papa, uh, has been big in my family. Since, and so I've known about it since I was a little girl. And I had written a, a mask piece when I was in university that a professor of mine um, he and I put together uh, some pieces for children. And so I was at that point even retelling the story, you know, bringing people's mm. awareness to uh, a different view, which was mm. not the traditional view. Uh, and, and that's what I did in the show as well is very interactive and ask the audience, so who is Pocahontas? You know, mm. and, and, and what is the perception? And I was trying to bring in an imagined brown woman's view you know obviously mm. um, that's 13 generations back so it's it's not as though I grew up on the uh, paw monkey or matapanai reservations in Virginia that's not the case at all uh, it's and so it was it was also you know it's it's tricky and it's become much more of a, a conversation it, since I did that in 2014 and I was writing it in 2013, but how it came about was um, that a director that I had worked with quite a bit in New Zealand um, who has since created a Tahi solo show festival um, in Wellington, uh, Sally Richards, um, she was doing her PhD in directing solo performance and she, mm -hmm. I had in the past come to her and said, I, I want to do this, but I can't do it myself. And so she came back to me and said, well, you know, we can do it in this way. And it was fantastic because then um, University of Victoria had, Victoria University, sorry, <laughs> had, you know, did all of the production and, and she did all of the management. And uh, I mean, I wrote it and you know played 11 different roles and uh it's it's was quite taxing um in a lot of ways and when we started in on it when we were we were coming into agreeing to do it I knew it was going to be so challenging that I I, I said to her I need to know from you that no matter what happens uh, no matter what arises in me you will reassure me that I'm not crazy and, and and I know yeah. like that sounds funny to say, but I mean it literally. Yeah, that, you know I have you know craziness in my family, and so that there were so many things going into it um, that at one point Sally was like, "Look, you can have a quartet, you can have, but just decide and commit to it." <laughs> because I kept adding more things, wanting to do, you know, like yeah, it was it was. That is my tendency uh, is to do too much. But yeah. Um, yeah, so the transmuting ancestral poison into potion was one of the main themes. Yeah. And so I was looking back, uh, particularly uh, through the matriarchal line uh, to one of my grandmothers, but my grandmothers are first cousins and that's part of the show. So my ancestry, and then closer to Pocahontas, first cousins married, and then my parents were second cousins. So this, mm. even though it's way back 13 generations, it, it I don't know, it's, it just, I resonate with it. It feels stronger in me. Um, and uh, so, for example, the way that John Smith wrote about Pocahontas um, the first viewing of her was that she was doing cartwheels naked. This was mm -hmm. customary for, uh, that helps to date her actually. She mm -hmm. would have been um, prepubescent because mm -hmm. young girls went naked until 
they had menstruation and then they would start wearing sort of more of an apron or then their attire shifted to indicate where they were. And uh, so that was completely normal. My grandmother, uh, and this is featured in the show, as a young girl did handstands with no underwear on. So she was wearing a dress, mm -hmm. but in front of, you know, adults and, and that became, you know, a problem. Um, and then when later she was diagnosed as manic depressive or bipolar, um, there was one period where, you know, she was found um, naked dancing in a fountain. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the context is everything. And that's what mm, I was bringing right. up in the show is that, you know, it, it, every, it, truth is relative, you know, mm -hmm. or, or who's telling the story is the story. Mm. So without the context, mm -hmm. we can call it anything. We can call it crazy. So for me to feel safe, I ha I've had to claim more of being an artist. And I, I still often don't. I'm not a big fan of, of titles or labels or, um, <laughs> but that's one where I felt like I had to really grasp onto it in a way to be able to then in the show, I do cartwheels naked. Mm -hmm. you know? and, then I, and then I address the audience and go, is this dangerous? Why is this dangerous? Yeah. It doesn't, it depend on how you're looking at it. Mm -hmm. Like if you're looking at it with a predatorial eye, this is, this is not, okay in our culture or if you're looking at it predatorily at mm -hmm. me as a woman then isn't the danger in you mm. I love that about the show you you really I mean I always feel like you're ahead of the zeitgeist you always seem to be ahead of the zeitgeist in terms of looking at it and going hey what we know about this woman is the colonizer story and yeah. that, that's what we see her we see her through that lens of the colonizer and just that little piece that you shared in terms of the fact that she would have, we can, we can know her age because of how she was showing up. And it says more about John Smith and his reaction to her as a young pre prepubescent woman doing naked handstands or cartwheels than it just says about her. Because what I'm hearing you say is she was just being a child in the context of her culture. Right. Um, and, and also what I bring up in that culture is that there was no rape. It did not exist. If, if, it, if it happened, the perpetrator was ostracized, was exiled. Mm -hmm. And you can't survive in exile at that mm. time in landscape. So it didn't happen. It just was not, it was not accepted. Now mm. we wouldn't say now that we accept it, right? I mean, we wouldn't well, think of it that way, but it exists now. Yeah. You know, for example, disease also didn't exist. And that's right. almost, that's almost, um, Sorry, it, ja it went we a little bit. On, it went a little jaggy, we're but you're freezing still a little bit. Yeah. Sorry, just keep going. We'll freeze. Yeah, just keep going. I think it'll it'll pick up. All right. So you're talk <laughs> talking about no no disease prior to colonialization in the Americas. Right. Okay. Right. I mean, like, how do we even conceive of that now? Yeah, I know. As soon as you say that, I'm of... like, is that true? How do you know like, that's not, true? Not that could colds. just be propaganda. Yeah, not even colds, right. So then, I, I mean, to whose advantage? Mind. Like, propaganda for whose advantage? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just noticing what yeah. comes up when you, when you say that. And then the next thing that comes up is how incredibly vulnerable that population must have therefore been, which we know, to European diseases being imported and how so much genocide was, you know, perpetrated through the um, importing of diseases willfully. Term mm. warfare. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's records of, you know, um, military officers making decisions to give blankets that were infested with smallpox. Yeah. It's, it's the beginning of germ warfare, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, actually, when I did that show, it's going to be, it's going to, um, there was a point where I stopped. Like, I, I got so overwhelmed by what, what the Spanish did. And I was like, how do I, how do I bring this in? How do I convey the atrocities? 
How do I yeah. convey the level of genocide? And at that point, like you're talking about being, being ahead, part of the trouble I find with being ahead is that almost nobody can see what I see. And yeah. that's where my fear of being crazy came in. Mm. Because I'm like, I, I, I can see this, but how do I, you know? Yeah. And, and, and even growing up, like the levels of genocide have been so... Um, normalized that we don't mm. even see it I mean we do now but even mm -hmm. then 2013 2014 these were not conversations that were happening yeah. and so it was it was a very vulnerable place and one of the reviewers was saying that and I think that was also because I was still <laughs> getting the material under under me um getting a grasp of the material but it was also the the content itself was very um challenging it was very mm. challenging at that time it, it was new Th these were conversations that weren't really being ha being had and and even the end part like I didn't know why I, I was writing it or why I was doing it like there was a part of me that was going like what is what is this end part like what is this here that I'm I'm doing you know and it was where I was stripped down just in like a little nude singlet and I'm like, basically going, women, stand up for yourself. And mm. this was before the Me Too movement as well. And, I, I, and it was coming out of me wanting to transmute, as I was saying, transmute the poison into potion. But again, it was without the context of other people doing it. So it felt really mm. um, precarious in a way, you know, not a lot of affirmation Mm. for what I was doing and that's why I, I so needed Sally like she midwifed it um, yeah and and I felt very vulnerable yeah after. I felt like actually that's not accurate not vulnerable because there's a, an awareness there of of the vulnerability afterwards I felt like an infant that's carried um mm. in the sense that I there was no, there was no, uh, how do I explain this? There was no um, sort of consciousness of me needing to carry myself. Mm -hmm. When I went back into the U.S., I had, I had no money, like all of my money, all of my energy and resources had gone into the studio. Mm. And so when I wrapped that up, I literally had like $165 and, um, I had made a sigil, a little like magic spell that I wanted to visit my grandfather. And literally two weeks later, one of my stepfathers said, do you ever think about coming to the US? Because I'd be happy to buy your ticket. I was like, oh my God, this works. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> Yay for sigils. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I had mm. a student who, who then supported me mm. and, and helped wrap up some of the business of the studio so it was quite a remarkable time but uh, and and so when you asked like where did this walk about begin yeah began there. yeah so then and when that's you go like almost back, 10 years ago yeah it would be almost 10 years so then when you go back to the states and you've just spent however long immersed in this story you know like researching this story writing this story birthing this story acting this story what did it feel like going home to your family? Like how connected is your family with their whakapapa? Like what's the, you know, you said you didn't grow up on reservations, et cetera. What connection mm. did you have to your culture? How did you relate to it pre coming to New Zealand and then after Pocahontas? Mm. Uh, well, and so it was about a year being immersed in the writing and the rehearsal um, to saying however long so that was about the length and uh my family has always you know so it's been traced back and recorded from early times you know when I was eight and we went to a family reunion Robertson you know very Scottish family but there's a great pride in this ancestry because it, it I mean you use the word propaganda I would say to a great extent, the story of um, Pocahontas and also the story of, um, I'm forgetting her name, starts with an M in uh, 
Mexico. Mm. It might come to me, but similar kind of, there's a romantic propaganda that's going on. And I think I also touch on that in the show. Um, so that was also why I was wanting to come at it from a different angle or, mm -hmm. and, and bring in the perspective uh, mm. of of the genocide, of, of, of the lack of communication at the very start, mm. you know, uh, at the very the start story... of those two cultures meeting. Yeah, because the story that we're told, the Disneyfication of it is that it's a love story and she falls in love with, is it John Smith, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But I loved how you just poked a hole in, and one of the ways, one of the ways that you poked a hole in that was when you talked about the sense of of smell and the bathing rituals of Pocahontas yeah. and her people compared to right. John Smith and his people. Do you want to share that little piece? Because I was just like, oh my right. god, of course. <laughs> right. I, I mean, you know, coming from England, which was was filthy at the time, mm. you, you know, like it's almost impossible for us to imagine. But it would be similar to to um it, it, there was no sewage you know like all of the refuse of human <laughs> waste was in the streets and you know people it just was would have smelled awful but so people didn't bathe uh you know maybe once a year it was it was very rare whereas um the culture the the connection to all that is um with these particular tribes of the the what's now called Virginia, so uh, the Confederacy, the Powhatan Confederacy, um, was a number of different tribes that had come together, and um, so they they had a daily hmm. practice ritual of of bathing in the water, even in winter. So. Mm -hmm. You can just imagine what what an Englishman would have smelled like, <laughs> um, not having bathed for a year, and that is such a primal sense, right? Mm. Like I, 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 to me, it's like no matter how um, exotic he might have been with his sort of reddish hair and white skin, and and the prophecies that they had of of white people um, coming, you. Know, it still, it still would have impacted, yeah, <laughs> the smell. But aside from the fact that John Smith was more like a brother, and so that's also what I was trying to address there was that it had so swiftly become this romantic story that, uh, and and there was another instance in his writings of a very similar dynamic. And I think it was when he was fighting in Turkey. He was a mercenary, John Smith. And so when he was fighting in Turkey and he was saved by this woman. So there's a similar theme there you know, mm -hmm. of him being saved. And um, even the writing that he did about Pocahontas was, it might've been 20 years after the fact. Mm -hmm. It was at least 10 years, but it might've been more like 20 years. So you have to ask yourself like, how accurate is any of that mm. 20 years after the fact mm -hmm. and what was the purpose of his writing mm -hmm. you know he was he was trying to gain entry into society or you know appeal to the queen or mm. but um I feel like yeah so looping back to when, when you came to yeah. back to the states in like 2014 right. or yeah what was it like for you going home how did it feel having been immersed in the story Right. Uh, well, you know, it was no wonder that it would premiered in New Zealand, where uh, Saka Papa is part of, um, you know, where even even a Pakeha will be able to join in on a, a Karakia or a Waiata or, you know, be able to say Kia ora at the very least, you know, mm -hmm. like... Um, <laughs> Whereas in the in the U.S. that that's been much harder, and par partly because there's what is it something like five hundred and thirty federally recognized tribes, and then a number that are not recognized, and and 
you know, so hundreds of languages, whereas in New Zealand, you have one language. Okay, there might be a variation of dialect in Wanganui, but, you know, mm. it, it's a unifica- unifying factor. Um, so I guess what I should say is that I became even be, so before I answer your question directly, mm-hmm. I became aware of water. That was the first thing I became aware of, actually, because um, I came into L.A. and um, northern California and so dry there and just aware of the arroyos, these like empty waterbeds and um, the relationship to water uh, and the then went into Phoenix, Arizona, and just this contrast of like air conditioning units and um, watering golf courses, and yet there's no rain. It, it, and and then, so that was really stark, you know, coming from New Zealand. Sorry, I have this hair that needs to get out of my eye. <laughs> needs to be disciplined. <laughs> um, so that and then as I traveled across the country and and came down into the south to see my grandfather um where it's much more humid and then traveled north uh on the east coast and uh, even got to the point of uh snow you know so Mm -hmm. a different form of water um when I got up to New York and then was given you know within the first month or so was given my first prayer song from the Ojibwe culture, and it was for water. So for me, looking back, you know, obviously I didn't kind of connect all of that as it was happening. Well, actually, another thing I should say is that um, a friend of mine, we made a, we created a song in LA with her, her partner's band, and it was all about water. Hmm. Like I contributed the lyrics and it was all about water. Hmm. So then given my first prayer, for water and having that connection into Ojibwe culture which is the same language base Algonquin language base as Pocahontas's people um, but not the same tribe Mm -hmm. and uh, you know so people talk about like stepping on the good red road and once you step on you can't step off Mm. and um so what's that I referring like, to? Can you, like, the good red road, I get a sense, but can you explain what that means? Uh, I know words. They're so inadequate. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, the The... The the awareness the culture the ceremony of uh connection to spirit to creator Mm -hmm. that is um first nation based Mm -hmm. you know it's yeah that's a sense it's not really right yeah (laughs) And so is it that phrase, is it specific to the Americas or is it more general in terms of the if there is such a thing as an indigenous way of orientating to reality? And I know that's a sweeping generalization. <laughs> yeah. Uh or is it specific well, to I, I, yeah. I mean, I would say the most general way of of um orienting to reality indigenous indigenous means sprung from the earth Mm. to spring up from the earth and so in the word indigenous itself we understand what it means to be indigenous which is to not be separate from the earth Mm -hmm. to to be from the earth (laughs) yeah um which does that imply that we then recognize the relationships the relating yeah does that imply the springing up? Does that therefore imply, you, like you just said, it's relationship? So therefore, if we spring from the earth, do we then are we honoring the earth as our mother? Well, so many, um, so many of the names of people, you know, so Anishinaabe means original people, mm. 
and I'm trying to think of uh, some other specific references, but a lot of times the 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 tribal name in their culture, like Maori Tongva means normal, is also coming right? to mind. <laughs> right. So there's a great example. It's, it's yeah. that within their uh, language, mm. the name of the people is the people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is 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 the. Um, Mm. So does it feel like when you really dove into this journey around your own whakapapa and looked at the telling of story and how the way we tell story defines, you know, perspective, et cetera, did it, does it feel, and then you were given a water prayer. I'd love to know what that means in a minute. Is, is that what you mean by it? it's like you stepped onto the, the road, you stepped onto the, what, the long red road, the wide red road? A good red road oh the, i knew there was a <laughs> so we, so we want to live in a good way we want to do yeah. things in a good way yeah so it's a good red road a good red road i love that so and, what does um, it mean yeah to live in a good way well i think you know one one film i really like and to kind of digress to more white culture is K-Pax because I often feel like an alien and so I really identified with the main character of like you know taking notes here I am on earth like trying all the fruits and taking all the notes and, and there's a great scene in there with the you know the psychiatrist or whatever when, when he's like well how do you know right from wrong and he's like all beings know right from wrong mm. Yeah. Like we know what's good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like for me, there's no hiding. There's no hiding. Yeah. There's, you know, like ultimately from mm. your conscious, your conscience from, from creator, however you want to understand, like, yeah. yeah. So, so we know, uh, we know what is good. So if we, there's any, if there's any question, then it's probably not good. <laughs> you know, I like if that. there's any like <laughs> doubt. So yeah. then those who were colonizing, you know, the colonizers who came and committed genocide in the Americas, this is this is pure like assumption or feeling, but like they must have known on some level that what they were doing wasn't good. You know, like the wholesale genocide of so many people in, in service of what? Like conquest of land. I mean, that's what I'm kind of curious about I, is like, how did those men and to a lesser degree women take, take, how did they take those actions? Like, I don't expect you to know the answer to that. Maybe that's just a mm. question for the audience to contemplate. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have any thoughts on it. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Well, and there's those, sure. I mean, there's, Interesting difference. So in university, I, I came across a historical anthropologist at where I went to university named Frederick Gleach, and he's written a number of books on Powhatan people. And specifically, one of the books was about warfare. So, and this is something that I experienced um, later on in the timeline that we haven't gotten to yet in terms of more interactions with uh, Ojibwe elders um, and Dakota elders. Um, is that their warfare is a teaching style. Hmm. So genocide is wiping it out, you know, or or there or there's colonization is like coming in, and we're gonna make you one of ours. You, we're gonna take away your language, your religion, your hair, you know, all of the the current awarenesses that we're having now about the schooling systems. Um, you know, and one of the elders that I had the the privilege and the honor who has since passed to um connect with on one of our on um the water walk was who created these water walks these prayer walks for water um had survived this the schooling system um yeah and so the teaching type of warfare um and again, this is this is to me, it seems like a, an initial lack of uh, taking the time, uh, an in, 
inability for whatever reason to take the time to really see and understand the differences and to recognize the differences, not only of language, but of culture. So for example, there was the, the Easter massacre, 1625, and uh, it, the massacre. If it had been a massacre, they would have killed all of the 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 white people all of the the colonists <laughs> um because they could have because they mm -hmm. took them by surprise they could have easily but if you look at it and this is one of the things that i was learning from from frederick gleach if you look at it they were just teaching they were going this is what we gave you this is the land we gave you you know <laughs> we were here <laughs> and we've as a host been gracious enough to give you this land and to teach you how to survive on it because you didn't come here with those skills. <laughs> it was amazing how many went there and had no like farming skills, had no, you know, like that yeah. was one thing John Smith did was like kind of whip them into shape a little bit. But um, they were starting to spread out. And so it was a, it was a, a teaching of like, mm. this is, this is your territory. Yeah. And that is what's um, interesting is that versus, you know, English warfare, which is to wipe it out. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The lag sometimes means we, we overlap. But I think this is what is interesting is that we perceive what is happening through the lens of our own filters. And so when two cultures yeah. come up against an incident, a happening happens. And one culture perceives it in this way and the other culture perceives it in that way. And then it, I guess what we've seen in colonization is that battle for dominance in terms of the way I see it is right. The way I see it is correct. Um, rather than recognizing, oh, how do you perceive that? What, what's actually going on from your perspective and listening to caring, even caring about that other way of perceiving reality. Um, mm. So what a ceremony and one of the I mean I'm trying to forgot the lag go ahead on what you were like to say before I ask that question <laughs> <laughs> that was so good um I'm not I'm trying to remember now if in, I incorporated in this directly in the show but it was definitely part of how I was discovering and researching and writing and then even beyond that I met with um, a quantum physicist named uh, David Pete who wrote Blackfoot Physics and his book had influenced how I was working as well and so he was a contemporary of David Bohm and Bohm uh, you know is known in quantum physics and yet struggled to convey uh, his ideas, his theories, you know, what he was working with, because quantum physics works with, you know, is it a particle or is it a wave? <laughs> or is it both? <laughs> and what he found is that how do we convey process in a language that's fixated on finite, on, on particle, on nouns? And so when he mm. met some Algonquin elders, he, he got some hope that maybe we could understand better um, because Algonquin languages are verb-based. So this is mm -hmm. what I mean by, you know, just as an example of what you're talking about, of a completely different worldview. We orient around, you know, cup, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to put the cup down. But, mm -hmm. you know, rough translation would be becoming a cup becoming a cup it's like it's mm. never and this is what we're starting to find with quantum physics is that you know th th that what we think of a solid finite material reality is actually always still in process mm. so if your worldview is that everything is always in process mm. <laughs> it's a completely mm -hmm. different way of orienting right mm -hmm. you know like three is not the one name of the tree it depends on the season it depends on the weather 
You know, there's mm -hmm. names for the tree that are based on like if the leaves are turning up and indicating that the rain is coming. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's a different, so it's a different relationship. It's constantly in relationship. It's much more present. Um, and also, but, I mean, another significant difference is a gift economy, essentially. Mm. They were a gift economy. Yeah. And so the value of, of offering. <laughs> mm. Mm. Hosting. Yeah. And I think those... There's a lot of differences, yeah. Yeah, those differences in worldview. I mean for people to even recognize that there is such a thing as worldview i mean you know when i'm when i'm watching and reading some of the comments etc particularly on linkedin or or on instagram and watching kind of people battle back and forth i'm like you guys have no idea there's different worldviews you guys have no idea that everyone is actually living in their own perspective of reality and people are fighting over reality as if there's one fixed reality it's like there's no such thing there's only ever perception of the happenings um yeah and so you feel into that idea of a verb-based language where everything is always in process and in relationship to everything else compared to a noun-based where it's definitive and just what it is and, and that orientation to constant change is not really acknowledged. You're going to have two different, very different ways of interacting with reality right there. Um, mm. Mm. And I mean, to me, the, the greatest example of how it could be possible for us humans, we humans, <laughs> is that in a, in a, in a forest, animals coexist, plants coexist. It's not a, it's not a monocropped field. Mm. You know, this is why a food forest is, is much more in line with reality really than um industrial agriculture mm -hmm. but the same for our interactions you know it's not it's not either or it's it's both and mm. yeah if we actually do all exist on this one finite planet and we can coexist yeah we can yeah <laughs> I, i'm down with that too like yes we can um okay I, I definitely want to talk about power but i want to get to the water ceremony being gifted the water song like what does it mean to be gifted a song and what was the water walk that you went on and one of the reasons i want to talk about this is because here in new zealand as you'll be aware there's a lot of controversy over the government's plan to do three waters etc and take control of the water from the local councils and all of this stuff around how we care for water not that i'm hearing the word care in there a lot <laughs> so share <laughs> yeah share share about the water being gifted and, and taking the walk mm. or walks <laughs> mm. yes there were a, a, a couple um so it's a it's a ceremony and it has since, so this was gifted to me in 2014 by my elder, my, my grandmother, my teacher um, mm -hmm. in upstate New York, whose uh, lineage is Susquehannock, uh, but who had made a connection into Ojibwe elders in Canada. So um, uh, the Ojibwe, mostly Eastern seaboard, but with the awareness that the the plague of the white men was coming um, <laughs> and also in search of food. So there's a whole origin story for them about uh, food. They split and some went north in what, you know, is now Canada and some went west to what uh, we now call Minnesota. And um, <clears throat> so my initial connection was with those in Canada. And so the grandmothers there spent five years debating whether or not to release the ceremony. Uh, and the reason they debated is because so much has been hmm. misappropriated, appropriated. Um, when you talk about power, potency, when it's dispersed 
with, and, and is not contained within the, the culture or the ceremony, it loses potency. Mm. And so uh, that was their concern is that it would lose its origin, its connection, its potency. And ultimately the decision was made to share it because they realized the water needs more women praying for it, mm. loving it. Yeah. And so in, in their culture, water is women's medicine, fire is men's medicine. Now it doesn't mean that, you know, there's not crossover. There are songs that men can sing. This particular ceremony is for women to sing and man's role in that is to stand guard. Mm. Now, initially, when I heard that, I was like, you know, being a staunch woman who has needed to have my own back my whole life, uh, as and and also like looking out for my female friends and relatives, um, there was a, a resistance to me in that. And yet, when I experienced it, it was profound. Something very seemingly subtle was very profound which was that I could then drop into the sacred and not have to have eyes at the back of my head to protect myself. Mm. And so much of these ceremonies that, that are fractalized, meaning that the teachings are in the structure itself. Mm -hmm. So doing it as it's given is important. Mm. And, um, so this particular ceremony is very simple. It's the story as well as the song that were the story of the origin of the song. And the words translate to mean, I take responsibility for the water and the sacred vessel that contains it. Hmm. Blood of my body, blood of the earth. So the water and my body, you know, the flow, the blood, and my body, the water, the river, the lake, the ocean, and the earth. Um, the key to me seems to be taking responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was instructed or, you know, directed to, to do it every day. So again, might take five minutes really to do this song. And, and yet, especially as I was traveling, I then had to look for water. Now there's water. I'm so much water. I drink water. I bathe in water. So I could certainly do it anywhere at any time, but finding water and doing this song, this ceremony to the water offering love, blessing, prayer to the water mm. really opened my eyes to water everywhere. Yeah. And every place I went. And, and I, like I said, ended up on this, like circling the globe for the next four years. And it was four mm. years essentially until I came back into the U S and you picked me up at the airport. I was so delighted. I was like, I'm back in New Zealand because my friends are barefoot at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> Something that wouldn't happen in the U S. So true. So true. Uh, mm. so, I'm, so really seeing like water everywhere, you know, how, how we're related to it, you know, it's so precious in Mexico city that it's, it's chained up, it's locked up in the dairies because it could be stolen, you know, and, and, you know, laws that you can't collect water in a basin in the city, uh, the grates over the water, the, and and because I'm in this in this ceremony, going to the water, realizing how often I can't get to the water, mm. or how often like the roads are right next to the water, um, and then also you know the beauty as well, and wanting to be by beautiful water, and then also realizing that you know the water that's the most polluted is act is really in need of this blessing. Um, so the next year with the same elder, I was invited to, 
to do a prayer walk with Sharon Day, who's um, Bois Fort Band of Ojibwe in Minnesota. And she had been asked to come out to Seneca Lake because a lot of uh, residents were protesting plans to store fracking um, refuse under the lake, which was incredibly dangerous and all sorts of, you know, just trying to protect, protect the water. And so it wasn't, it's prayer is a form of protest, is a form of activism. Mm -hmm. And what I love about it is it's, it's love, it's blessing, yeah. it's honoring, it's, it's, um, and that is often far more courageous. <laughs> I mean, it's all <laughs> courageous, you know, standing up is courageous. Um, So yeah. this um, water walk, which was uh, uh, created by Josephine Mandaman, who uh, is from Thunder Bay, Canada, and um, she passed away 2019. And she had um, been asked by one of her elders, like, what will you do for the water? And she was like, well, I don't know what I can do. And then she realized, well, I can walk. I can walk for the water. And so copper is very sacred and, and has a, a, a cleansing relationship with water. Mm -hmm. um, there are some vessels that you can get that are lined with copper because it helps to purify the water. So the, the water walk um, around the lake, we start at one point and go all the way around. Um, a few years later, I was uh, on the Missouri River water walk where mm -hmm. we start at the headwaters mm -hmm. and that was um it was an amazing dawn uh because we always started just before dawn um with you know the golden light on the water and then two little otter heads popping up out of the water and here's the you know the water coming up out of the ground and it's purity like pure source water so we gathered water from there and we carried that water the entire length of the Missouri River to where it outletted into the Mississippi. So that's 2,600 miles. Ooh. What we actually walked was not quite as much because the, we can't walk next to the river the whole time, right? So, but uh, the idea or the, the, the ceremony and this is intensive ceremony because every step is a prayer. Now, we talk about mindfulness, you know, the mindfulness practices that we have in yoga and meditation. And this is, this is an action. This is, you know, my previous experience with anything like this was Zen meditation, Zen walking mm. meditation, you know, where mm. you're like aware of every step. Um, so it was, boot camp for mindfulness i would say <laughs> um this you know the seneca lake one took three days um and and i didn't realize how it worked uh initially i i thought we had to walk the whole way so the first day i walked 25 miles uh in moccasins like i walked mm -hmm. the whole you know i was like ready i i needed a mission at that point in my life i was like the world is on fire. I need to, to, like, I have a lot of warrior energy and I, I need to direct it to something that is non-sectarian, non-denominational, you know, and for me, it was water. Mm. It's, it, everything needs water. There's nothing that doesn't come from or need water. Yeah. yeah. And so that was, I felt like I can devote to this because everything else felt like it was that always cutting and dividing and oppositioning. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I love that in terms of activism, the fact that you are moving from love, you're moving from blessings and it's devotional. Um, but it's so potent as well. Like I remember when um, we were both living in West Auckland and, you know, you're doing the water prayers every day, of course, and going to the bodies of water and it definitely increased my awareness of water and I found that even though I don't know the prayers that you do that when I would go over bodies of water particularly in the city bodies of water that just 
felt you know and I would just say prayers I'd make them up I'd just make up prayers and just see the water and honor the water and acknowledge the water and say those prayers and it was definitely as a result of of what you were doing just spontaneously expanding out onto my experience of reality um what would you say yeah. to people that were like oh that doesn't make any it doesn't do anything it doesn't create you know it doesn't there's no impact of that you're just making shit up well how would you respond to someone <laughs> <laughs> so it's like prayers for water <laughs> <laughs> well um yeah right uh, uh let's see well it's, a, it's certainly a bigger conversation there's a lot of different ways and it would be contextual you know how i would respond yeah. to it um but just generally, um, like I said, we are water. You know, there's varying percentages depending on how you're looking at it. It's molecularly, it's like 99%. And then, you know, actual water, 70%, I don't know. But we are so much water. So uh, it is funny. I, I guess I see so many ways in which... Um, there's a little resistance in me, a little irritation in me with people like <laughs> Michael Pollan and um, James Nestor and Wim Hof, you know, because they're white men. Mm. But because they're white men, <laughs> they're <laughs> able to um, speak to white men and, um, <laughs> and to the <laughs> mindset that needs that kind of like scientific proof, you know. Yeah. Um, and so I appreciate and value that. And, and mm -hmm. I appreciate and value how they're opening uh, more minds to the the power of breathing, the power of um, psychedelics, um, the power of awareness. And so I would say there's a similar thing, you know, like Masaru Emoto's work. And there's also a woman in New Zealand, uh, Ada Austin, who's doing um photography of of water mm -hmm. and um masari moto's work is photography of of water and so that really helped people you yeah. know who are skeptical uh that needed to have some proof or some you know factual information something to make sense of um so it's again it's coming from a different language and and that's what yeah. i'm really interested in i'm interested in the bridges mm yeah and so i'm 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 expressing my human you know frustration at the same time that i recognize that's that's not just his way of thinking or that's not just that particular way of thinking i've had that way of thinking i can think that way you know like when i was on the missouri river water walk six of us women i was called the mansplainer <laughs> <laughs> I was the one I was you know I was the one I'm talking about now uh, uh, being over there and I'm judging as like needing the facts I was the one who was always like well did you know this area and did you you know <laughs> <laughs> so there's just it, it's relative there's yeah it's relative to what you're in or who you're speaking with or connecting to or yeah so I I, I need to you know give that caveat of like <laughs> and I, and but, I love um, that you immediately say it's contextual you can't give me a response to that because you don't have the context you don't have the felt sense of the person where they're speaking from da 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 da, da. It's, and I think that aspect the recognition yeah. that we're not dealing with just words you know as humans there's a multi-dimensional nature of communication that's always going on um mm. yeah yeah so I'm aware that Absolutely. time is, is kind of ticking by. I know you and I can talk for hours, but I would love to talk about power. Forever. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I'd love to talk about power because you named Power Center, you know, P-O-W-A. Um, mm. Yeah, what is power to you? What, is, what does that even mean? How do you see it, you know? Right, yeah. Uh, well, and the naming of the studio came out of that um, ancestry. So, um, how power P O W A? It, I equated it, um, and of course, we're translating, so you always have to give some room for translations to miss the mark. But roughly, it's similar to mana 
in mm. today or Māori. So it's it's um, in the uh, Paul Monkey, Matapanai were the two main tribes. So Pocahontas's father was Paul Monkey and her mother was Matapanai. So mm -hmm. two different tribes. And the uh, power means dream, to dream. Mm. And so it's the root of powwow, right? Mm -hmm. So people know the word powwow. It's been absorbed <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and appropriated, um, which is, you know, is an interesting comment of, on what we're talking about in terms of does it lose its potency as it gets farther from source? But so this is something that um, Stephen Jenkinson talks about with his Orphan Wisdom School, that when, and part of why I love etymology, the roots of words, and, and he reiterates it by saying like, know your language, know your words, and they will not let you down. So mm. for me, I always go back to, um, <clears throat> what's the origin? How far back can I trace the origin of this word and then that may help me reclaim it. You know, mm. so for example, the word manipulate is a, is a really good example because um, automatically I have a negative connotation with manipulate, right? Mm -hmm. But it, it comes from manus, which means hands, means to change something with your hands, to change the mm. form of something with your hands. No negative connotation. Right. So, so for me to reclaim clay. it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I just add the word positive manipulation. <laughs> I say positive manipulation so just to reclaim it. But um, <clears throat> power, for example, um, comes from the, so there's sort of this imaginary uh, shared origin uh, among a lot of our languages, English, Romance languages, Persian, Indian languages called Proto-Indo-European. And so the the P I E root of power is poti, and that's where we get words like potent. You know, so mm -hmm. the it it spreads out into different words, um, and and it means so a lot of times a word will stray very far from its root, mm -hmm. but in this case it doesn't stray very far. So <laughs> it means powerful. So mm. powerful means powerful <laughs> you know, like it means itself um which is much more akin to mantra and why i love mantra because you know for if i say egg it doesn't mean i'm an egg you know in english a lot of our words we're not embodying the essence of the thing we're saying but mm -hmm. in mantra we are so mm. we're intoning we're embodying sat satya truth mm. you know or 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 whatever the the word is um so but interestingly with power um it and it also means lord so then of course i end up on these little rabbit holes of lord what does lord mean mm. it means the one it's related to loaf like loaf of bread and it means the one who guards the loaves lord <laughs> means the one who guards the loads loaves um and so powerful, Lord, master, husband, capable, possible. These are all kind of root definitions of the word power mm. from that root, poti, poti, poti. Um, so husband means, it comes from, from another root, bu, which means to, to be, to exist. You know, and when we, when we husband something, we look after it. And mm. even the the like pre root of Lord, the root of that is were, which means to perceive, to watch out for. Mm. So this conversation about power, like what is power, you know? And I and I remember having when I was doing teacher trainings, and we'd get into Manipura chakra, and a common word there is power, mm. um, will power, and. Uh, there was, you know, negative associations among a lot of the students not wanting, you know, really struggling with owning their power or taking in feeling empowered because they'd had power over um, and didn't want to 
do that to others. Mm. So it feels to me like there's a, a, a conversation to be had there around control around I'd like to actually hear from you on this because it's just the beginning of a thought of like I can I cannot be a victim if I'm empowered even if somebody is trying to harm me yeah or, or is harming me so there's this it seems to me especially when we're looking at those roots about awareness mm. and then to get back to the Powhatan um, so Pocahontas's father is often called Powhatan Powhatan I'm not sure of the pronunciation I have to be honest um, but so he's often called chief Powhatan which is actually redundant because Powhatan means chief dreamer Powa mm -hmm. dreamer Pow Aten is the indicates that he's the chief dreamer. Powwow is those who gather together to dream together. Mm. So, um, so he's his actual name is Powhatan Wahun Seneca, is his his name. But for me, with the studio, I was also picking up on um, power to the people, mm -hmm. and on um, the power shell, which is so mm. significant for um, Aotearoa uh, in that it, it has a very like innocuous exterior, but on the inside is brilliant rainbow um, beauty. Mm -hmm. And um, and then one other reference was Poa, which is a uh, Tibetan burn tradition that I've been connected into for 20 some years, um, which is, um, a more animistic, sh shamanic, pre-Buddhist Buddhism. <laughs> it's a Buddhism <laughs> before the Buddha uh, that comes from Tibet. Um, and Poa is the transference of consciousness through death. And you practice that in dreaming and sleeping. Um, and so because I had named the studio that, we actually had some... Uh, some Tibetan Buddhist um, workshops and sessions and lamas and uh, swamis come in uh, mm. because of the naming of it. So mm. that refers back to the, to the naming, but I, I t I've said a lot. So you, <laughs> yeah, I'm just absorbing it all. Some of the things that really struck me was when you talked about um, doing the dream together like dreaming together and the chief of the dream. So the dreaming together is like, oh, one thing I'm aware of at the moment is that, that I know that teenagers and young people are distraught about the fact that they don't feel like there's going to be a world for them. You know, like the climate change yeah. and the identity politics and anxiety and all the things happening. And it's like, where are the dreamers? Because I feel like what happens when we come together and we dream up the more beautiful world that we know is possible you know, and that collective sense of dreaming. And for me, when I feel into what is power, partly it's the ability to vision and to bring that vision down from the subtle into the manifest. So I just made a little note mm. there. I'm like, ah, oh, the power to dream together. What is that about? You know, because I mean, I have no idea. But the fact that there was there were tribes where they had a chief dreamer, what were they dreaming up? You know, what were they dreaming of? What was the role of the dreamers within that tribe? Um, and then the other piece that you mentioned in terms of if one is completely in power, can you be a victim even when something horrendous happens? And I just want to differentiate, I think this is important, between the kind of the legal definition of victim where something happens and you are the victim of it and then victim mm. consciousness, which feels as if life is happening to you compared mm. to being in power where there's a recognition that life is happening for one so mm. and I can feel the difference and when I feel into what that's like it's like oh okay something really shitty could be happening to me but if I'm in power I, there is there is a yeah I'm not in the victim consciousness related to it there's a different energy there completely and I can sense that um mm. yeah 
Yeah. I also want to just briefly mention what you said about mantra, about the way that mantra, we're embodying what we're chanting. And, mm. you know, I noticed, you know, I've practiced for decades, as you know, done a lot of deep practice probably in the last seven or eight years. And it's in a sense of speaking from embodiment and how powerful it is to speak from mm. embodiment. So if I'm speaking there, say, for example, of heartbreak that I actually let myself feel heartbreak whilst I'm speaking so words are coming there's a there's a real resonance in the body between the words being spoken and the energetics being transmitted and to me that also feels like another level or layer of, of power of being able of just embodiment being actually mm. embodied mm. Mm. beautiful yes I was um, listening to um, Laurie Anderson, who's a performance artist that I have always admired and um, her Buddhist teacher and, and how she and Lou Reed were trying to embody and learn uh, in their being uh, one of his teachings, which was to uh, feel sad without being sad. Ooh. Yes. So, uh, when you so that's what was sparked by what you're saying. You know, mm. there's the and also what I wanted to say in terms of um things happening. Uh I call it steerage. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like um, I think I'm going this way and then something goes no <laughs> you're going you're... or if you you know like if I keep going this way it's probably going to hurt more um so yeah. it steers me it doesn't mean I don't feel it you know and yeah. I I oftentimes I mean I think it helps me with acting uh which is another thing that I you know, that we've talked a little bit about that I do, but, um, and partly why I did the solo show, you know, something I had frustrating today was that I had this amazing audition and then didn't get called back. Mm -hmm. And so part of doing that solo show was not only for the, the material and the content, but to have a context that I could play in because the frustration yeah. as an actor, like if you're a painter, nothing stopping you from painting but as an actor you know the way that it's set up mostly is that it's always what the other person wants and whether or not you fit into it and and mm. their story and, and whether or not I can be it and um there's some there's some play in there for sure uh but in terms of power you know being able to put forth what it is that I want to put forth and so that's I had some steers <laughs> just before we got on this call I was like oh I guess I'm not doing that <laughs> mm -hmm. um which would yeah so so the steerage like paying attention to the directives it's a dance I find between yeah. what what is it that I am am drawn towards that I does that I want to create or co-create that I uh, am passionate about and mm. we didn't even get to the stand-up comedy but that was what led me into stand-up comedy is that I was like nothing is funny they, I know what you mean. I, making I, all these jokes about shit, and it's like that's not fucking funny. You just like pissing on someone. They're not funny. <laughs> well, yes, that and in the world, you know, in the world, mm. as I was as I was touring around and and seeing the water and 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 women and you know like all of the difficult you know, like all I was and and you know having a serious nature to begin with, um, <laughs> really feeling things. Um, I thought this isn't funny and yet that then turned me that became the steerage of like well let me inquire into what is funny and so I started studying stand-up which basically meant watching a lot of Netflix and but really with like this mind of 
what what's happening here how does this work when do I naturally laugh um and then how much of it is is um manipulated uh no <laughs> it's, is fascinating, but not necessarily making me laugh. You know, I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of comedy that, and, and so what I started to realize is that as an actor, it, it was like, this is the highest art form, yeah. comedy. And so then it became this thing I need to move towards. And um, because I see it as, as getting in the back door behind people's defenses with the truth, you mm -hmm. know, so you're like slapping them with the truth, but in a way that they're enjoying it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're like yeah give me some more. whereas most of the time that's been an issue my whole life is that I've been a little bit too direct and 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 sometimes struggled with how do I say what I see or know when not to say it yeah um, and so that became the puzzle of all the time how to turn how to turn it around how to flip it around how to how to go from the th and, and not abandoning the things I care about, but actually taking the things I care about, and that's my material. So my material is spiritual and ecological, two yeah. things that most people don't tend to joke about. And <laughs> especially <laughs> ecological, you know, something that we're really uh, aware of needing some serious attention. Um, how, do I, how do I make that funny? Mm. How do I bring people on board? How do I get the truth in? Um, you know, you think of the the jester in the king's court. He's the only one who can speak the truth without having his head cut off. Yeah, I love that. He's the Look one that can speak truth. He speaks truth in the power. last few years. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If I, yeah. Oh. So good to talk to you, Melissa, and you thank too. you so much for sharing your wisdom and your journey over the last 10 years or so. Um, we did kind of talk about maybe doing a little performance at the end. I don't know if you're feeling it, because like you said, this is not really the forum for stand-up. I know you're working on another piece. I don't know if you're it's still in, <laughs> it's still in draft form. So I don't know if you'd like to share that yeah. or whether you, you're happy to complete at this point. Well, um, depending on your timing, I mean, I can do a little, it's about 10 minutes, the, the draft piece, which might be interesting. It's like me speaking from the future in the year 2100. Um, I reckon we just do it because I love your art and the way you explore. And if people don't want to listen, they can go make a cup of tea. <laughs> but right. I would encourage yeah. all of you and to also stay and the to listen, hey? <laughs> With the caveat that it's you know in rough form um yeah. and the stand-up is on is on youtube so we can put those links in yeah um, so people can see cool. see that okay so i might make you right, i might spotlight you on the video if you're all right with that can i, <laughs> can I do that yes i think yeah. yes. and i'm gonna um i will need to look at my material yeah, you, you pull up the material and we'll dive in and see. I like this idea, the vision from the future. I'm hoping it's a more beautiful world vision, but I, <laughs> that's my own bias showing up in terms of like, yeah, let's generate a magical spell here of what we'd love to see happen. But I have no idea what your vision is. All right, whenever yeah. you're ready, Melissa. <laughs> Okay, I will begin. <clears throat> I am making contact with you now from the future. Buzzing in to meet you in your present from the future. That's not really how it sounds out here. It's not Star Wars, Star Trek, high tech. I'm just touching on how you currently imagine the future. In reality, we have a softer way as we long ago moved away, way beyond the seeming need for machines to intervene, to go between. Way out here in the future, 77 years from your now, where it's what you might call year 2100 AD, we've finally accepted our other senses and honed them. 
We've become super creatures, not from implants and AI downloads, uploads, what have you, but from direct transmission, from going seemingly backwards, way back to clan of the cave bear styles where we read one another. We listen with such attuned antennae that fewer words are needed. But to bring the story to you in a way you could understand, I've had to translate from energetics that we operate on now through gestures and then more grossly into words and media for you still require affirmation of your own budding sixth, seventh and beyond senses. The world we so enjoy now is one where no one can possibly lie because everyone can read everyone. No words are needed. No external images are needed. Communication is direct energy exchange. Far more skillful than your rough ways back when, no offense, I lived then too. I know what you think you know. Can you believe that we grew up in a world where we killed other living beings? We regularly took the lives of others. <clears throat> we called it roadkill if we killed them with our cars. We called it pork, beef, pate if we killed pigs, cows, ducks for food. We called them predators if they were more clawed, toothed, and fierce than we were. And we killed them for that. We called them wrong if they were human. Can you believe we nearly killed them all off and ourselves in the mix because we couldn't see how vital it was that we all lived together? As a child, 120 Earth years ago, I grew up with a riotous chorus of frogs, crickets, and locusts as backdrop to my firefly collecting whole fields of fireflies lit up the night skies that bats swoop. and other flying ones with poison. When I was little, plastic was too. Yogurt still came in waxed cardboard cups and trash bins had no liners. In my 50th round around the sun, a new disease was named in birds, plasticosis, death by plastics, and 80% of humans tested had microplastics in their blood. Can you believe in our race for comfort, in our greed for ease, that we nearly killed ourselves. We did, in fact, kill 107 species in those first 50 years of my long life. More than two entire species died for each year I survived, never to be seen again. Can you believe we thought safety was suffocation? We thought covering everything in plastic would keep us safe from germs, make food safe for consumption. Consumption, something we did so much of that we consumed the very thing that was meant to keep us safe, the plastic itself. It may be hard for you to imagine, those of you here in the future with me, but the world wasn't always as alive as it is today in 2100 AD. Now that I'm in my 127th rotation around the sun, <clears throat> Our air is so pure that we all breathe easily. Yet when I was younger, I was allergic to so many things that man had made I literally could not breathe. We take it for granted now, this clear, fragrant air, so full of vibrant, buzzing, pollinating life. Ah, so you want to know how we changed? How we salvaged the remains of what we had desecrated? How we resurrected life from under the plastic shields? Finally, we grew up a little and remembered to show up kicking at the door of our host planet because our hands were too full of offerings of gratitude to be able to knock. We got back to the earth and went deep into relation with her by moving up above her a bit, giving her room to breathe without the impact of pestilential people. We tackled ground pollution with networks of mushrooms 
We tackled water pollution with fine nets that sieved out all the islands of plastic refuse, but left the fish and other creatures to be once more at home in their own sea. We moved our food up vertically so the land could regrow its wild self, so that the animals could rewild themselves without our wide swaths of poison-laden monocropping. We tackled air pollution by moving our vehicles into the air and powering them without extracting further from the belly of our planet. Even the farts from our air pods gave back to the atmosphere. We applied our prodigious and profligate minds to life over death. Simple, really. It's so easy to see from this vantage point on the other side. But way back then, in the darkness, in the final hour when too many were choosing to add direness to the dilemma, what inspired us was sometimes light, sometimes goodness, and sometimes innovation. The seeds of seeing differently took hold, and like the imaginal cells of the stupefied caterpillar, they valiantly vibrated until the surrounding, initially resistant cells couldn't help but join in. Eventually, the butterfly was formed, but it still hadn't emerged or flown. We still didn't know what we were or what we might be. I'm proud to say I come from a people who many centuries ago in a battle that seemed to be all but lost, arrived late to the cause. They became convinced of the cause late in the day, but because they were fresh, they saved the day. They made a new world possible for their people. Late but in earnest became their mono, motto. I was raised and bred with role models that showed me it's never too late. Never, 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 never give up. And other ancestors of mine survived the genocidal tactics that tried to make their people extinct in the name of progress. And these relations always whispered in my ears and twisted my hair so that I'd hear that life trumps all. They are still standing. In fact, we are still dancing, singing, sharing the celebration that skillful interdependence is the only sane interspecies politics. What we had to do to build this new world was believe in a science of kinship a business of relations, a paradigm of impossible to escape interconnectivity, a plan of unity. Part of our pollution was noise. We couldn't hear the wisest beings who speak in winged patterns, the cleverest ones who swim in purest waters because we had polluted the waters with deafening defense system sonar. We had to stop protecting imaginary self-created borders and boundaries in order to preserve what was left so we could prevail at all. Our latest religion at that time, science, saved us by learning the languages of the water, air, earth, fire, the brilliant intelligence of the critters with two, four, eight, and no legs, the perceptions of the plant beings, we dared to love them. I'd like to say we were wise <laughs> and saw it all coming and shifted gears quickly and cleverly, but no, you know, we were slow. We almost let it all go. Our arrogance nearly won the day. We had to be laying low in order to learn the languages of the earthworm, the platypus, the mycelium, and so many more. You know, it wasn't always this easy as it is here now. And it's key that we remember that. But it wasn't always so hard as it is there for you either. I want you to know what got me through and over that threshold. By being brave enough to grieve those lost in the wars of capitalism. By facing up to the crimes we committed and our deep denial of the death toll we wrought with our greed. And yet also not losing sight of what's possible, I learned to trust the longer journey. Others did too. We owned up to having put so many living beings in the bin, and in so doing gave a proper burial to the thylacine, the Japanese otter, the green blossom, the little earth hutia, 
the Mexican grizzly bear, the phantom shiner, the Mason River myrtle, the Saudi gazelle, the Oahu tree snail, the Pinta Island tortoise, the South Island kokako, and the Western black rhinoceros. To name, honor, grieve, just a few of our fallen comrades. Listen, shame was our saving grace. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. <laughs> Ah, uh, things on that, Melissa. Mm. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I especially love the bit where you're like, we begin to feel into the sixth and seventh and eighth senses, et cetera. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> expanding our perceptual awareness of what is happening, what is possible. Mm. Ah, oh, blessings to you and your journey to all that you touch and inspire for the way that you show up. And thank you so much for coming and have a conversation here. Thank you. It's great to see you again and to uh, connect mm. over the ethers. Yeah. In the so that was Melissa Billington. Oh my goodness, that woman just knows so much. She's really big on etymology, the origin of words, as you might have guessed. And she just knows so much on so many things. Like she does the research and then also has that multi-dimensional perception of reality. Um, it was a little jittery, so I'm really hoping that the recording is A-OK. -okay. Um, I will go back and review. Thank you for joining us for that conversation. I hope it sparked some curiosity in you, particularly around worldview. How do you perceive reality? What's the filter that you look through? And depending on what your um, mother tongue is, how does that define the way you, you perceive reality, right? And this is a really interesting thing to um, consider when it comes to the resurgence, for example, here in Aotearoa of Te Reo. Uh, I was reading someone who was trying to say that learning the Māori language is completely worthless. And I'm like, oh my God, you have no idea of what language means, of the way that language keeps culture alive because language informs world view. And I love the way Melissa spoke about how some of the languages um, that she was familiar with are process orientated, verb orientated, rather than noun, object orientated. And just that, you know, just that shift between perceiving reality as a process that is always ongoing, there is no fixed point, or perceiving reality as objectified, right, objectified, that is going to have a huge impact on how one relates to reality. So many things to contemplate from the corridor there that Melissa and I just had. Um, Check the show notes. I'll absolutely link to some of her stand up comedy and I will also link to Pocahontas, Hauntas, Pocahontas, which is the one woman show that she did when she did that deep dive into her own whakapapa and the colonization of the story of Pocahontas and, and what actually happened. And, you know, that too, I think, is so interesting to start to realize is that there's this reality of what's happening, there's this perception of reality and this perception of reality, and neither one is right nor wrong. Right, both of them can coexist, but if we're curious about each other's perception of reality, how do you perceive reality? What are you noticing? What are you feeling? What is it bringing up for you? And then vice versa, 
then maybe we can work towards a more harmonious understanding of this world that we inhabit. All right, my name's Karalia. Thank you so much for watching. Do make sure to, of course, like, share, follow, and do all the things. Thanks for listening to Conversations with Karalia. And trust that you enjoyed that nuanced deep dive into spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. If you love my take on the spiritual path and you're looking for more insights like this, then make sure you subscribe and like. You can also check out my website, karaleah.com. That's K-A-R-A-L-E-A-H.com. And subscribe to my weekly newsletter.